Just please join us at the table if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, at the table, at the round table. Feels like class, <laughs> teachers calling <laughs> people to the front. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to be here. Um, we are, uh, this is Nusrat and I'm Sarayu. Um, and we're here to launch uh, our report and toolkits that focused on artificial intelligence and the impact of human rights. It was focused on India, but uh, our strong viewpoint has been that um, artificial intelligence and its impacts are something that every society will feel. Uh, so it's something that's very much a part of a global conversation. Um, and thank you also especially for taking the time to come here while the opening event is going on. Um, I do know that uh, you know it's a choice to be in this room. Um, in terms of the structure of this, uh, we hope it's very much a conversation and not us talking one way. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start with uh, introducing why we undertook this work of building out the toolkits and writing the report. I'll quickly highlight some key findings from the uh, re research. Um, and then we'll, we can have a discussion of about seven or eight minutes uh, or more if uh, people are willing to stay back. I hope that sounds all right and uh, look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Nusrat. Thanks, Sari. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, my name is Nusrat Khan, and I work with the United Nations Development Program in India. Um, I work for a specific program called the Business and Human Rights Program, uh, uh, which is, and uh, it was under this program that this uh, we partnered with Aapti uh, to develop this uh, piece of research, which has uh, taken a good life of its own, I must say. I'm very, very pleased with the way it has been received. Uh, but speaking just briefly to introduce the program itself, uh, uh, it focuses on uh, achieving sustainable economic development uh, um, overall, and we sort of premise uh, our entire conversation in doing so on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, this is, of course, a, a normative framework which was adopted by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011 and uh, was almost unanimously adopted by countries, uh, all member states. Um, and, and basis that, uh, uh, I, I think the the entire program is uh, based on the premise that, of course, businesses are a force of good. Uh, uh, th th there are a lot of uh, positive outcomes of a business enterprise, uh, like job creation, infrastructure development, uh, uh, information dissemination, knowledge dissemination at speed, which information technology allows for. Uh, but uh, sometimes there can also be adverse impacts uh, of, of business en enterprise. Um, uh, and, and I think... Uh, in, in, in creating uh, profit maximization, it is important for businesses to be also mindful uh, of uh, their un uh, sometimes unintended and uh, unintended consequences of their business actions. Uh, mm, of course, uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights that I just spoke about uh, is a three pillar framework. Uh, it is the protect, respect, remedy framework. Uh, it is it uh, outlines the. Um, state duty to protect human rights and which really talks about regulation and laws. Many of these are being debated at the IGF currently uh, on AI technology and digital technology overall. Uh, respect uh, um, um, framework which uh, places an obligation on businesses to respect human rights and, and in doing so take care of certain actions uh, uh, to, to address, mitigate and prevent human rights risk across uh, their supply chains. Uh, in this case, uh, Saru will speak about uh, a, a set of uh, uh, questions we've developed in our toolkit, uh, which uh, business enterprises across four sectors adopting the use of AI technology may take uh, take on to mitigate the risks across their uh, operations. And finally, the, uh, the third pillar is the uh, pillar on remedy, an extremely important one, uh, which uh, calls for states and businesses both to provide access to grievance regret redressal mechanisms. So should there be any violation of a right, uh, uh, there needs to be uh, uh, there there needs to be a channel through which it can be uh, addressed. This, in the in the course of uh, the state structure, could mean uh, the court of law, uh, but uh, in in the course of a business operation, uh, could mean uh, uh, could mean an in-house um, uh, mechanism put in place by a business enterprise to address a grievance uh, um, that a consumer may have or any other stakeholder may have. 
Um, um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, of course, I mean, we, we all know that the new digital technology, uh, and including the uh, AI technology, has, of course, brought unimaginable uh, change to the lives of many people on, on, on the planet. Um, at its very best, uh, the positive outcomes have included job creation, economic growth, uh, empowering uh, civil and human rights defenders, etc., uh, and even um, just the efficiency of, of, of science overall. Um, um, digital technology and its use has, of course, also accelerated the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and, our, uh, and allow us to uh, sort of progress in a way to actually fulfill our mandate by 2030, uh, um, uh, which, is, which is the uh, end time uh, for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, um, some shadow sides of innovations as well, uh, which have come into uh, uh, focus very, very sharply uh, in the recent past. Uh, there is enough uh, reports and evidence uh, uh, of uh, evidence also generated by uh, 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 by tech companies themselves uh, uh, speaking to uh, uh, the dangers of privacy infringe infringements, uh, 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 dissemination of hate speech, uh, which also fuels conflict. Uh, in in, in regions, but also uh, um, algorithm uh, discrimination, and this is something that our research also speaks about uh, uh, in, in quite a bit detail. And this could, of course, uh, limit the way one accesses a job market, uh, but also access to public services, financial services, or even uh, in many cases the criminal justice system. Um, uh, and and and. Uh, I think there is there is enough consensus amongst businesses, governments, and uh, uh, and um, other stakeholders in the ecosystem that these risks must definitely be addressed. And, um, and just before, um, and of course, the UNGPs, like I spoke about, provide a very comprehensive and. Uh, uh, a uh, consultative framework uh, uh, that can inform efforts by a range of actors, including governments and companies, to identify, prevent, and mitigate, and even remedy human rights harms uh, um, related to digital technologies. Um, before I hand it uh, over back to uh, Sarayu, I'd like to also talk about a little bit about UNDP's own digital strategy, uh, which uh, has a long-term vision to create a world uh, in which uh, digital technology is empowering force for the people and the planet. Planet, and we intend in uh, doing so uh, uh, to create a digitally enabled uh, programming that is amplified development outcomes by embedding digital uh, um, digital mediums across UNDP programming, empowering digital ecosystems to support uh, uh, um, and create more inclusive and resilient uh, ecosystems, and uh, overall create a workforce that can support these two objectives. Um, and I think within this context, uh, the Business and Human Rights Program collaborated with Aapti Institute to uh, uh, to acknowledge the role of digital technology like uh, uh, the artificial intel intelligence technology in and in, in, um, creating massive uh, positive outcomes for the society, but also uh, to be mindful and perhaps investigate a little bit what are uh, some of the uh, possible harmful impacts that it could have on rights uh, across four sectors, uh, uh, financial, healthcare, retail, and gig. Um, and uh, to sort of elaborate more on findings and uh, some of the solutions that we proposed, um, I'm, I'm, I'll request uh, uh, Sari you to step in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nusrat. Um, we were indeed very excited to have participated in doing this piece of work. Um, it was uh, interesting, not just from the perspective of uh, the way in which we think about human rights mitigation, uh, but also to bring together various layers of what we see as uh, technological protections um, that might operate. Uh, we had two levels of insights, and I'll very quickly summarize both. Um, the first level being that um, we understood a little bit about how AI harms might emerge and operate. Um, and then second, we had sector-specific findings around the ways in which human rights risks emerge and might be mitigated. Um, and as Nusrat mentioned, we focused on four sectors in our work. Um, we focused on platform work, we focused on retail, we focused on health uh, and financial services um, as the four key sectors for study. Um, and just to understand the selection of sectors, um, health and uh, financial services were selected because they had consumer impacts, which is users and consumers experience the impact of um, AI deployment in 
uh, health and financial services, um, and we looked at retail and platform work to understand the impacts of AI on individuals as workers. Um, and so with this division, we proceeded into trying to understand how AI risks might emerge and then be mitigated. Um, the first insight uh, that we had from quite a lot of our work was that uh, we tend to think of AI as a technological artifact that operates alone uh, in isolation from company policies, policies and regulatory frameworks. But across the four sectors, uh, we learned that uh, AI technology or the technological artifact that underlies AI um, works very closely and in tandem with com company policies, policy and governance that determines how it's operated and how it's deployed. Surrounding that is the layer of the regulatory framework, which determines what you cannot and can do. Um, just to give you examples at each level, AI technology might be the credit scoring algorithm that underlies and sits at the core of um, a product or a service. Company policies are decisions that sit as a layer outside that. And to give you an example, uh, the algorithm that does work allocation in platform gig work, um, it, the operation of it is determined by decisions at the company level. So incentive structures, for example, um, the required hours, log on, log offs, deactivation policies, et cetera, are determined by company decisions. Um, outside that um, sits a layer of data protection regulation, for example, which determines how you might use or operate or engage with the data that you collect. Uh, so to think of AI, AI regulation, or human rights risks as uh, uh, disembodied from this sort of three-tier three, three -tier structure that operates might be problematic and limiting what you can do uh, to manage human rights risks. Um, in order to understand human rights risks um, in consultation with the UNDP's program, uh, we decided to take a wide lens um, because there are the international frameworks that operate um, across the world and particularly in India, uh, but specifically um, in India, we decided to look at the Indian constitution, which does encapsulate some rights, um, as well as look at various statutes that might have relevance both sectorally or operate across um, for all Indian citizens. Um, this wide lens allowed us to take a expanded view of human rights uh, and particularly account for emerging concerns uh, that might come from the, from the nature of the technology itself. Um, the big finding, of course, were, uh, were first that the risks and the nature of risks varied sector-wise, uh, but having said that, there is no sector that is risk-free. Uh, in financial services, with a focus on AI-based credit scoring, we learned that there were risks to privacy, financial access, uh, challenges around grievance redressal. Uh, with respect to gig works, uh, gig work and AI in algorithmic intermediation, we found that risks emerged uh, with respect to the standard of living due to volatility of income, absence of social security, um, absence of privacy, um, as well as challenges around effective remediation. Uh, in the context of healthcare, particularly pre predictive healthcare analytics, we found risks to life, uh, equality, privacy, as well as individual autonomy that emerged from the deployment of AI. Um, with respect to retail, um, while this is a sector where AI-based automation is as yet emerging, uh, we did see and did anticipate risks to livelihood, uh, standard of living, and worker autonomy. The upshot of all of this is that we need to take a networked view of uh, both impact um, as well as human rights mitigation and governance. Uh, we think there are three paradigms to it, the first being a need for regulation and active work in terms of regulation on data, data use, data access, guardrails including the ways in which we audit AI and deal with AI, uh, as well as systems and standards, some of which might need to have uh, or emerge from global conversations. Second, we think business is a very key stakeholder in all of this, uh, given that they are the ones very often uh, making AI, uh, though deployment context might vary. Um, so discovering and highlighting business incentives, particularly trust, consumer adoption, as well as headline risks, might be useful. Uh, but this, we believe, uh, is a conversation that, continues, uh, that needs to continue to happen. As a result of all of this, uh, particularly the emphasis on the role of businesses, we have built out um, our business and human rights report and toolkit. Um, for those in the audience, and I don't know if it um, applies online as well, you can scan that QR code to access the report digitally. Uh, but we also have a gargantuan copy 
uh, here for those who wish to refer to it offline. Um, but um, you know, this is the this is the report. It comprises two parts. There's all of the learnings that we had from trying to unpack the application of AI and human rights risks in these four sectors. But what we have built. Uh, because of the role of companies in this process um, is toolkits that companies themselves can apply to govern their human rights risks. Um, if they're not at a state of readiness where they can apply these human rights uh, toolkits, what they can do is to use the toolkits as a way to understand pathways uh, to better human rights governance. Um, and I'll pause here uh, and happy to take any more questions either about the methodology, findings, um, or uh, the toolkits themselves. Over to you, Nusrat. Just one thing, uh, and, and I think the toolkits are based on the three pillar framework of the UNGPs that I spoke about earlier, uh, the Protect, Respect, Remedy, and I think they also sort of speak to the human rights due diligence process which, which the UNGPs talk about, which is basically, it's it's really a set of questions that businesses might, must sort of uh, reflect upon uh, to, uh, to sort of identify where the gaps lie as far as uh, human rights risks are concerned, uh, and, and sort of uh, um, and, and then proactively, of course, uh, try and mitigate them. It's also an ongoing process, uh, um, and, and, and it is hardly a one-time process. Um, and, and we've we've realized uh, that uh, that is very, very true. Also, for uh, for uh, use of artificial in intelligence technology, of course, it's also very true for other sectors uh, beyond the use of digital technology. So uh, you will you will find that uh, the, the questions uh, uh, are sort of bifurcated into the three sets uh, and speak for action. Uh, of course, by the state, but uh, but most importantly, also by the business itself, and finally, uh, on remediation by by the state and the business. Yes. Uh, so yeah, we would uh, love for any questions. I'm sorry. Just an administrative note: um, we've placed the report with the QR code link. Should you wish to scan um, and access it, we are happy to also leave our emails. Should you wish for the slide deck, I saw a few people taking pictures. Uh, so happy to email the slide deck and the full slide deck should you wish to look at a 100-page uh, document uh, as well. Uh, but we can pause now for questions. Um, my colleague Asta Kapoor is here to moderate this discussion here. Uh, we have my colleague Vinay Narayan who is online. So should there be any online listeners, um, please uh, post your questions in the chat um, and we can, um, we can take them. Thank you. There's a mic over there. If, sorry to inconvenience. If you could just introduce yourself and ask the question, that'd be great. I think it's on. Yeah. My name is Shizuka Morika. Thank you for having us today. And I, I would like to know more about the, the model that you had on slide titled AI is not the tech alone. And I am wondering why AI is in the center rather than human needs. <laughs> so, and the impact of that model, when we have human needs and going outside to facilitate AI technology and organizational policies. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if you guys have thought it. Happy Should we take, take a that few? Yeah. Okay, There's sure. a question as well. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna. Can you pass this along to him? Thank you. Hello. Yeah, yeah I'm Chang Ho. Uh, I'm a lawyer uh, coming from Japan. So, just a two quick questions. So, the one question is. Uh, among the risk you presented, uh, what I is there like, uh, any particular, peculiar or the special risk in relation to like generative AI? I mean, is it the kind of you know the same kind of analysis will apply, or is there any kind of additional risk which you have identified? And my my second question uh, for both of you is to because I'm a I have some expertise on the business in human rights, but not much on the digital light and in and. and, and and in a lot of the toolkit around the business in human rights, it's quite focusing on the supply chain in the uh, downstream side. I mean, how we can you know source and you know a lot of human rights due diligence and so on. So yeah, just wants to know you know I mean what is the your recommendation you know in relation to the government or the corporation on the like this kind of you know downstream uh, you know supply chain approach, which is more relevant to the to, uh, you know digital sectors. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, I'm Richan. I represent the tech community of Nepal. So I definitely want to understand uh, the resource methodology, like how you came across those recommendations and framework. And the second is uh, I want to understand a little bit more about the risk of AI uh, with uh, gig uh, workers. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and take a few of these questions and pass the more difficult ones on to Nusrat. <laughs> um, but uh, to answer your question, ma'am, um, AI is not the tech alone. We were using that as a way to understand where human rights risks emerge from, rather than thinking about the societal value of AI. Uh, I don't know if that speaks to your question, but what we were trying to argue with that, and happy to have a more detailed discussion offline as well, uh, was that there is a core technological artifact which sits in a company with the layer of governance over and above it. And outside both of those sits the layer of regulatory governance, which permits or lays the framework for what uh, a company might or might not be able to do. We hope that that's not a model by which the utility or the usefulness or the impact or even the feasibility of AI itself is uh, addressed. I think our starting point, and we do remark on that in the report, uh, is that the deployment of AI technology in some of these sectors is already underway. Uh, and then how do we understand and problematize where risks emerge from? So that's that's how we've built that framework and that model. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we thought about it. Um, to answer the question on generative AI, uh, this report specifically does not tackle generative AI. We think there is a case, um, and we hope to undertake some work on that soon, uh, to understand generative AI as almost a specific category. But we think the problems with generative AI arise from a couple of standpoints. First is that generative AI reduces the cost of content, content production to zero, which is that you basically put in a code and then, you know, with a few variations and some practice, um, content production in a variety of languages is quite close to zero. Now overlay that with um, social media technologies or dissemination technologies, the cost of dissemination is also zero, uh, which means that basically with no friction, you can generate and disseminate content, which might contribute to some of the concerns that Nusrat mentioned when she made her introductory remarks, um, such as hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, et cetera. Um, the usefulness of generative AI is not to be written off either, um, because it can be useful um, in enabling very targeted, distinct communications from the state, uh, though this needs to be governed with some degree of caution. Uh, but having said that, the challenges we believe of generative AI emerge from um, both the reduction of the cost of production and the cost of di dissemination to zero. And of course, it's all overlaid with the fact that um, very often business interests are too central and at the forefront of driving some of these products and services. Um, so I'll pause there and happy to have a greater discussion offline. Um, I'll come back to the one on the digital rights and the supply. I feel like it requires a little bit more delineation, uh, unless Nusrat has to has some uh, thoughts to offer. But very quickly on the methodology, we had a, a multi-step methodology. We started with, of course, understanding the UNDP framework as well as mapping out the potential focus areas with respect to human rights themselves. Uh, where would we source our understanding of human rights from? Then we spent a bit of time selecting the specific type of AI technology within each category, though we did start with an understanding that we would focus on consumers and workers. Uh, post that, within each sector, we followed a combined approach of sec secondary literature review uh, and expert interviews within each sector, and that included where it was available, data analysis, um, as well as doctrinal analysis to understand the implications of the law on these sectors. Um, so that was the methodology followed within each of the sectors, and we followed a roughly similar pattern. For the gig work, uh, we did have uh, a small segment, uh, qualitative, where we did speak to gig workers, uh, but that, that was not the central piece of the research. A lot of it relied on expert interviews and doctrinal analysis. So I'll pause here, uh, but happy to again come back to the conversation on gig workers um, later. Um, you're right. I think a lot of the business and human rights uh, uh, sort of focus has been on due diligence downstream. And I think uh, in, in this case also, uh, the kind of recommendations that the report presents is, uh, for example, uh, 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 
for the state, uh, we I, I, a lot of uh, the recommendation in the Indian context was the absence of law. Now we do have that law uh, uh, because I mean this report was released a, a year back, and we've just uh, had the Parliament uh, pass a data to, uh, data protection uh, law. But uh, that was a glaring ga gap uh, a year back. Um, uh, so it's for, from a re regulation perspective, from a business perspective, and this again uh, is sort of uh, uh, going into the thematic uh, uh, details. But uh, uh, as I understand. And the data set representation uh, on which the algorithms were, uh, were created weren't representative enough uh, uh, was, was a finding also that emerged from the stakeholder consultation. So one of the recommendations that we had was uh, uh, improve your data representation uh, uh, across all four sectors, but uh, um, also uh, details like uh, upskilling. Um, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, movement from, for, for example, I think in retail, uh, uh, where you move to automation, uh, th there is a clear obligation, of course, primary obligation, I, I would say, on the state to upskill its workers uh, uh, for the use of this data technology, but also on businesses to uh, take up uh, some of that upskilling role. Um, um, then I think uh, with respect to gig workers, some of the issues that sort of came out were uh, the surveillance, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the massive amount of surveillance that uh, a lot of these apps uh, allow for, um, uh, whether uh, right from um, health temperatures uh, uh, to movement, uh, um, uh, but also uh, the finer uh, uh, other slightly of technology uh, consequences like the lack of social security that gig workers generally uh, overall uh, have. Um, of course, we do have uh, some uh, uh, states in India, I think one state in India, which now provides for that social security, uh, uh, but... Um, I think uh, these were overall the kind of uh, recommendations that uh, the report presents. Uh, we also talk about the need for feedback mechanisms uh, uh, within uh, uh, for for whether it's a gig worker trying to uh, get in touch with a certain company with a certain grievance, or uh, whether if you are somebody who's applied for a loan uh, uh, and and have has been rejected, there needs to be a sort of um, um, clear reasons communicated to you about why a certain loan has been rejected. Um, and I think one thing for me personally, because I'm I'm not a thematic expert on the subject, was uh, the whole idea of explainability of AI, and I think uh, uh, the algorithm. Uh, came out very clearly that uh, uh, companies need to uh, create these algorithms uh, and AI technology in a way that it's explainable and transparent, and that is in many ways the foundation to uh, uh, to sort of mitigating any sort of human rights uh, grievance that uh, uh, any stakeholder which interfaces with that technology may have in the future. Um, yeah, I think uh, that uh, that in a nutshell uh, is that. I'm happy uh, to come back to the gig workers question okay. if you would like more detail, but uh, happy to defer to you on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. That's why. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the room? I've checked. Um, are there, yeah, any comments, questions? Um, great. We'll hand it back to the speakers to do closing remarks. Oh, you have a question? Great. Um, wait, um, there's a mic there. Hi, my name is uh, Christoph Zeng. I'm uh, the founder of uh, AAA.ai Association based in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, uh, my concern is uh, about uh, exactly uh, we, as we mentioned earlier, the generative AI and its uh, zero cost uh, equivalent for content generation. Uh, now, knowing that uh, a country like uh, India uh, heavily depends on uh, its uh, relative low cost of uh, labor, especially in the uh, information technology sector. Now, uh, even Indians cannot compete with generative AI, right? So there's, no, there's no point in competing with something that's uh, uh, close to zero cost, uh, let alone uh, Americans or, or Europeans. So, um, um, does your service have uh, so far conducted uh, research or survey on uh, uh, potential uh, indirect impacts? Because these are quite difficult to measure. Uh, using AI on one computer having uh, reduced man hours on another computer, that's, uh, that's something very subjective to measure. Um, 
how do you suggest to um, at least try to quantify this uh, impact? Happy to take that, and thank you very much for this question. I think um, it makes the case for very specific, I believe, sector-focused inquiry on the ways in which generative AI would affect um, job loss, so, and it's definitely a second-order effect that emerges from the use of generative AI. Um, some of it is in what have already been noted, areas such as um, code, software application, software development, um, legal services uh, is also another area where uh, a significant amount of work and op employment opportunities could be disrupted. Actually, any kind of job that... Uh, so we as an organization hope to undertake that research in the immediate future, particularly understanding the specific implications of generative AI on a sectoral basis. But there is also, because of the cost of content production uh, being zero and the cost of dissemination already being zero, there are very visible, immediately discernible first order effects, such as disinfo, misinfo, uh, which might be harder to quantify, but uh, are necessarily existent as well. So we think it's both categories. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Nusraf, any last remarks from you? I, I, I think I'm learning about generative AI and, and, and the effects that it may have. And in fact, I mean, we've been we've been talking about also sort of uh, unpacking how the, the impact that it has on gender uh, and the entire spectrum. Uh, uh, so we're hoping to uh, uh, to sort of. Uh, come up with uh, a piece of research which sort of allows for that unpacking, and especially in a country like India, uh, uh, where there are already uh, sort of uh, uh, certain um, skewed notions uh, 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 of, of gender in terms of also sort of gender equality, uh, et cetera. So um, a technology such as this one can sort of uh, um, um, only amplify uh, uh, the harms uh, um, that uh, that already exist in the society. Uh, so uh, we're hoping to sort of uh, uh, unpack uh, the use of generative AI and, and the impacts that it may have on, uh, uh, the differential impact it may have on gender. Yeah. Uh, great, thank you so much, both of you. And also to add that you know we do also work on other kinds of businesses in AI, which is data labeling, which in the context of India is that cheap labor reimagined for AI, which is people sitting and labeling images, which is a large piece of work that we've also done in the past. But thank you for, so much for this conversation and this perspective and to the audience for engaging. Um, thanks. Thank you. And just to reiterate, the report is available here with us if you want to read a 170 odd page report. It's also available via the QR code. Uh, and we're both Astha, I, Nusrat, we're all around, so please catch us. Oh, um, actually, let me just, code, um, I think it's at the table. I'll just hand it to you, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.